behaviors, to not falling in this trap that thinking that testing is going to be sufficient for these kinds of systems. Um, and there it is. So we've been experimenting with this and uh, using formal methods in the distributed systems class to try to, try to push these ideas forward. Um, another thing that, that was really helpful, right? so one of the things that was hard, I mentioned you know, this re-verification. Uh, it was really hard to get a sense of where we are, like how close we were to finishing. Um, and it was really frustrating when proofs were slow. So one of the, the things that um, I helped contribute, this might be slightly, well, maybe I can do it this way. Yeah. So this turned out to be a really useful program. Uh, this might be the only time somebody who's giving a lecture on Coq has shown uh, awk code. Do we even know awk anymore? So, so awk is a, yeah, awk is a great little programming language. I love it, right? So what this does is uh, it just like counts how big proofs are, right? Um, and it, it spits out a big CSV of the proofs. And we built several things like this and uh, integrated it into uh, the uh, Verity CI, right? So if you're not using continuous integration in your verification, uh, like day-to-day -day practice, you are missing out. You should totally do that. Uh, but anyway, so now every time CI runs, oh boy, gone too far. Uh, every time CI runs, it actually does this sort of analysis of all the proofs, and it spits out these reports per commit. And what's nice is that we can actually see, uh, you know, what are the longest running proofs, how long did they take, how much was the time to do the LTAC versus the proof checking. Uh, and at this point, right, this doesn't look too bad, we sort of have one outlier. But what's useful about this is this gives us a sense for, you know, what's the limit of parallelization, right? How fast could we recheck these? What's the bottleneck? And then, uh, you know, when you're frustrated, you can, you know, go chip away at making those proofs faster. And now we've gotten things to be pretty lean, right? So uh, this is like the top 20 or something, uh, but we have stats on all of them. Uh, how long they took. And a long time ago, right, there, was, there, there were these sort of big, you know, we'd have like three proofs that took a ton of time, um, or, you know, five or six or whatever, and, and this was extremely helpful in figuring out uh, what was slow uh, whenever we had to go recheck all the proofs because we made a change. Um, right, and you sort of see, also see the build times. There's no admits, but this is often very useful. So as an example of a, another project, Oh, and also like the proof sizes, so that's, that's also helpful. Another project we have currently going on, I'll talk about it more here in a little bit, is a verified implementation of CORD. And here you can see more longitudinal data of, uh, you know, admits going down over time. Um, but also in this case, right, it's very useful when you have a team to be able to go figure out where all the admits are. Uh, and what's nice is that this gives you some context and a link, so you can go jump exactly into the repo uh, where that admit is and kind of browse around. Um, so this is just sort of one example of these sort of proof engineering tools that, uh, that, that we built as part of the, the RAF verification. Um, and I, I think like CI, things like these, these reports are very useful. Uh, but also one of our colleagues, uh, Carl Palmskog, has been taking a, a sort of uh, bigger picture approach to it and has this, this push of trying to get proof engineering considerations into the software engineering community. And he's uh, you know, actually started publishing papers on how to do proper proof engineering, right? Principled methodology for verifying real systems at scale, like in practice, uh, in, in uh, you know, publishing that work uh, at software engineering venues, um, which is really excited. His most recent paper is actually on regression proof selection, which is a classic problem uh, in regular software engineering, right? Uh, so when I do regression testing, a lot of times I actually don't have budget to rerun all my regression tests uh, every time. So how do I figure out which ones are worth running? Uh, what's important, and uh, he's sort of has we're looking at the analog of this for when you recheck proofs uh, during development, right? So this is maybe not for the final build, the one that you're about to release or ship or something, but just when you're trying to do development, you want quick feedback so you can make progress while you're you know writing proofs. Um, so we're really excited about this stuff. Uh, there's a, a couple other things that um, I think are useful there, but maybe in the interest of time, we'll sort of press on. So. Uh, you know, proof engineering was important, sort of outreach, building tools. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that we still can't do with Verity, right? So there's this thing that several of you have sort of uh, picked up on, 
which is this sort of the difference between clients and nodes in the system. Uh, and the fact that the set of, of uh, you know, nodes in the system is fixed throughout the entire execution. And that makes Verity not the best fit for like peer-to-peer -peer systems, right? When I have uh, you know, distributed systems where nodes are constantly joining and leaving. Uh, for example, there's a protocol you might have heard of called BitTorrent. And when you use that, right, nodes can join and leave sort of arbitrarily. So now if you want to have some invariant about the system, it's really tricky because you know, the people who are actually participating in the system can change all the time. And nodes don't know who else is participating in the system. So for something like a consensus protocol, that can be a real problem, right? Like, whether or not I commit an entry depends on what the majority is. But if the number of people participating keeps changing, the notion of majority changes, you can see why this makes proofs tricky, right? Like when a node gets a message, what can it really conclude? It doesn't even know who else is in the system. So it'd be nice to be able to reason about these kinds of systems because it turns out they're often quite tricky. Um, and Cord is one such example. So in order to support this, this sort of, uh, you know, sort of like failure, of nodes dynamically joining and leaving arbitrarily, uh, we've been uh, working on this notion of punctuated safety, right? And so here, the idea is that because nodes can join and leave so much, a lot of times uh, the, the, the intuitive specification, the thing you want to say about the system is actually just not true, right? Like the spec that you want to be true about the system uh, doesn't hold in the face of churn. And what these systems are really doing, what they're designed to do, is to maintain enough state such that if churn subsides long enough, they will get to where they've restored the safety property. Right? So for these kinds of systems that tolerate churn, it's all about making sure they maintain enough information so they can repair themselves. Right? This is an example of a class of what's called uh, self-stabilizing protocols. And this is really tricky to do. It's easy to not quite have enough state. It's easy to do the repair operations in the wrong order. It's easy to, in the midst of a repair, start having churn again and have things get screwed up, right? And so for all the same reasons we normally want to verify distributed systems, we want to verify these too, but we have to do this different kind of specification. We're not going to be able to just do uh, regular old safety properties. We have to have some liveness baked in. And for that, we have this notion of punctuated safety, right? So essentially the idea is that, you know, over time, the system initially starts off, and then things start going haywire, uh, but then churn begins to subside. And as long as it subsides long enough, you have a guarantee that the system will reach a state where the target safety property holds. So you have sort of these two properties. You have the safety property, uh, and you have this sort of stabilization uh, you know, that, that say, the, the system maintains enough. And uh, 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 one of our alums, actually, Ryan Dungess, he's a PhD student at Cornell now, uh, working with, with Nate Foster. Uh, you know, he was uh, in, in, on the Verde team for a while. Uh, we've been hacking on this. Um, another thing, right, okay, there's some examples of systems we've been looking at. Uh, another thing that I think uh, is sort of interesting, so, does anybody know who this guy is in the top left? Yeah, he's a Turing Award winner, right? Leslie Lamport, so famous person. And uh, back at the end of the, I always get this wrong, is it? We're now in the 21st century, right? So the last one was the 20th century, right? So at the end of the 20th century, uh, Lamport uh, had this sort of attack on uh, you know, modular approaches. And he had this, this, this talk, this paper titled, uh, you know, Composition, A Way to Make Proofs Harder. And, his argument was basically that when you want to do things modularly, you have to think more. It's a lot easier if you don't abstract away the details and you just have access to the details and then when you want them in the proof, they're right there, right? You have to go back and forth and think about how to get just right abstraction, how to make things combine in general. Uh, and so, you know, here if you, if you read the quote, he says something like, uh, you know, nobody's gonna care about modularity in the next 15 years. And uh, basically he was right, because it's been more than 15 years since he said that. Um, however, you know, I think it is, uh, you know, we, we've been thinking about this, and after writing 50,000 lines of proof, uh, we thought, you know, it would have been nice if we could break it up into smaller parts, right, that had more independence, and we could compose those more easily. Right? If you could uh, reason about systems instead of in terms of these sort of fault layers, you could have, you know, different pieces that, that click together. And so, along with uh, Ilya Sergi, uh, We've been trying to do horizontal composition, right? So in Verity system transformers, uh, we think of this as providing vertical composition, right? I can take a system and I can divide it into layers of fault tolerance handling, and then I compose them into a system uh, that gives me these guarantees for sort of realistic networks. But what I can't do is I can't separate out the clients from the rest of the system, 
right? Clients are this, these opaque black boxes. I can never really effectively, you know, suppose that I knew something about all my clients, then could I prove more about my system? Or uh, could I have a system that, could I write a proof that said, well, if I knew this about my client's behavior, then I could give the clients back a stronger guarantee? Like, it's, it, you know, you really can't do that very easily in Verity. And so we built this uh, uh, distributed uh, core logic called Diesel uh, that allows you to do sort of uh, more modular verification by teasing apart the components of a distributed system, not in terms of fault tolerance, but in terms of like separate groups of nodes that interact according to sub-protocols. You can build that up. Um, and we're not really going to go into this today. I would strongly encourage you to watch uh, James's talk from Popple is up on YouTube. He did a really nice job. Uh, one cute thing that I'll mention if you go read the paper that you might be interested in is that you know, the normal notion of separation where uh, two things have basically complete isolation from each other and uh, they don't interact so you can sort of reason about them independently. That's not always quite what you want for distributed systems. Because actually a lot of times there is some interaction between the components. But you want to still be able to tease them apart. So, so we have this mechanism called the hooks that allows uh, one protocol, one, one uh, sort of sub-distributed system to constrain, to sort of add preconditions to the transitions of another component and thereby compose their guarantees uh, into something bigger. And it's kind of a, a neat mechanism that folks might have fun checking out. Okay, so uh, that was the, the big picture for Verity. Um, you know, it's, a, it's been a big project. We've been working on it for years. Uh, the first sort of batch of students working on this are going to start graduating next year. Uh, so we're going to be looking for more people. Um, and if you are in a position to hire, there's going to be great students on the market. Um, but there's a, a bunch of stuff that's also still left to do. Uh, I think one thing that just is kind of like a, a meta comment, um, I think that we sort of lucked out choosing distributed systems for a couple of reasons. So just like uh, you know, Andrew was saying earlier about crypto, you know, crypto is a critical domain where the people who are writing the code care a lot about correctness, they're motivated to use formal methods, and they're already super smart hackers, right? So these are the kind of people that we want to go after with verification first. They're sort of the easy targets, right? It's a harder sell for somebody who's writing like a, you know, JS web app thing to get them to drop in and start doing formal proofs independent type theory. Um, but the people where the rubber meets the road on this critical infrastructure are, are a lot more sympathetic. So I think that was good. Distributed systems have that same kind of user, you know, the same kind of developer community with those kind of that ethos, that, that, those principles. So they're receptive. The other thing that's really nice is that a lot of the most critical distributed systems need to be crash safe, which means that, like we said, right, they have to be, the handles have to be atomic, they have to persist their state after every uh, operation, which means that those systems run at the speed of disk. And if you have a system that's running at the speed of disk, the difference between a tuned implementation of the handlers in C and the difference between the implementation from like, you know, using Z's in cock and extracting to OCaml is not that big, right? So this is also a domain where we didn't get dinged. We're doing system software, but even with, you know, pretty simple extraction of cock to OCaml, we got performance that was, you know, comparable-ish to uh, systems that people actually use and w without worrying a lot about the implementation. Now, there are other systems that don't run at the speed of disk. And so I think you know, one thing that would be interesting would be to combine uh, Verity with things like verifiable C. Can we write those event handlers in verifiable C and use proofs that we have about uh, you know, the, the, the purely functional model in Galena from Verity right, and improve a refinement from our Galena handlers to an implementation in verifiable C? I think it would be a really cool project. Um, I think in general, more connections between these big verified frameworks and these systems uh, would be good to do. Actually, Leonard wrote a VST, or sorry, a verified system transformer uh, for HMAC a while ago, I think. Um, so I think these connections are really good and exciting. Sorry? So start an afternoon, you work through the Verdi files, and then you see, Boom. I mean, it's the same embedding as for the serializer deserialization. It is exactly the same. Something on yeah. the side and the opposite on the other side. Um, yeah. Same proof, just plug in a different function. Yeah, exactly. So, so the, you know, the HMAC basically ensures that uh, the network hasn't flipped bits in your messages, right? And it, it's a lot like the, the serializer. In fact, we should probably just bake it in with the serializer. Um, but anyways, okay, so uh, one problem, I wanted to give an example of a, a problem that I would be really excited to work on that I think is super important that we have done nothing on. Um, as far as I know, nobody's looked at this, um, but I think it'd be very cool. And I think, you know, verification, uh, is the, the right set of tools for the job. So this problem is update. So every once in a while we go over to Google 
um, in Seattle, and we get lunch with those guys. And uh, you've tried to figure out, like, okay, well, like, what's actually hard? What do you do? And eventually, I think Doug, or maybe it was James, somebody came up with this question, which is like, you know, what engineering consideration like, drives the way you do development? Like, what is the thing you, that you are so worried about that it dominates every other thing you, you know, the way you do stuff? And it turns out the answer is actually update, right? So for a lot of critical distributed systems, like, it's a distributed system because it has to always be available. It has to always provide service, right? You never stop running it. But you still need to update it to fix bugs, add features to do stuff. So how does that work, right? Like, I'm going to change the implementation of the handlers on a node while the system is running. And now I have two versions of the handlers interacting. And maybe these were sort of proved independently, right? So even if I knew that a totally blue version of you know, Raft was correct, and I tweaked it in some changes, I had a different version, I had a totally green version that was correct, that actually doesn't tell me anything about a world where I transition and I just updated one node, right, at a time, which is presumably what will happen. Um, so I think being able to formalize this and reason about it would be cool. And there's some obvious uh, first steps, but right now we don't have a good way of saying like how these should be related. We have no idea how to do these kinds of proofs, like what the semantics even looks like. Is this a failure kind of thing? Like, like what happens here? How does it work? Um, there are some sort of first things you might do, right? You could imagine, well, we uh, support update by actually running every node. Um, you know, uh, uh, it, you know we, we can do this within Raft by basically synchronizing updates to like elections. So we say like, well, look, after this term, everybody agrees that they're using this new version of the handlers. And this way we get sort of an atomic update, right? Everybody sort of switches all at once. But even that code, right? So that might work. But what happens if you want to update the code that's coordinating the updates, right? Uh, this is, you know, people actually have these kinds of problems. In fact, one of the things that the, 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 the team at Google uh, mentioned that they often have to do is you actually have to stage updates. So, like, they have a change they want to make. But if they just rolled out that change, you know, incrementally even over the next week, it would break stuff because it relies on invariants that aren't true of the current system. Right? So they have a change they make to the system. It relies on the state satisfying some invariant, which the previous version doesn't satisfy. So now what they have to do is they have to manufacture a fake feature, which they, so they, they delay their actual thing they want to do, they delay that another week, and first they roll out a fake feature, and all that does is establish some invariant for the distributed system, so that then they can safely roll out the actual update they care about, right? How do you stage this kind of stuff? Could you synthesize those things? Could you, could you automatically somehow figure out, like, okay, well, I have this, you know, I have the existing system, doesn't have an invariant, I have an update that relies on it, can I synthesize some version, some intermediate, right, that allows me to make that transition smoothly and prove that, uh, you know, I don't, and nothing goes wrong while I'm doing the update. And so anyways, there's a bunch of different things here. I think this is a really interesting problem. Uh, you know, this is definitely be a, a very cool paper. Maybe it could turn into a whole PhD, I'm not sure. Um, but I think there's just a lot of juicy stuff here. So uh, just wanted to close by again mentioning all the, the very incredible people I've been uh, Super lucky to work with on this project. I want to thank the DeepSpec team, especially Leonard, uh, for organizing everything. It's been a blast to hang out. Um, and most of all, I want to thank all of you guys. It's been really fun chatting. People have been really good engaging with questions and discussion. Uh, please don't be a stranger, and I'd be happy to take any other questions you might have. People are probably hungry, I guess. Or, oh, yeah. Uh, has anyone compared the advantage and disadvantage between using functional style definition and relational style definition when uh, formalizing distributions? So instead of implementing the handlers yeah. uh, as like Galena functions, what if we just wrote, you know, yeah. some, uh, some, yeah, some relation to describe how it, how it evolves? Yeah, there is some, oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, so I was just at PLDI. No, 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 I was just at Flock. I was just somewhere a few weeks ago. I've been traveling much, I don't remember. Uh, but somebody asked me the same question, and somebody has been working on this, and on the, my feet right now, I can't remember who asked me that question. Does anybody know? No, but yeah, somebody's working on that. Oh, that reminds me, there was one other thing I wanted to mention. So last time, yesterday, at the end of the, the lecture, I kind of went on this rant about like, 
everybody told us it was impossible and so we did it. And then they said that was impossible 